and welcome back, everybody, to Black Bull Podcast. Today we got Dave, aka Winston the Whale. Yeah, look at that. Hi. <laughs> so um, Dave was um, referred to us by RX Goals. He speaks highly of you. You seem pretty cool, but we don't actually know that yet. I I would say <laughs> all good things about him as well. Yeah. <laughs> He's my right hand man. He's Such my a best friend, friend. Good friendly yeah. person. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I want to hear about your name. How'd you get the name? Winston the Whale? Yeah. Uh so when I first moved out to Portland nine years ago from Charlotte, North Carolina, uh I uh I just got really nervous. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> just got really nervous. <laughs> But <laughs> once you go into like history stuff, like, oh, you're shit, like, I, have to like talk oh, about, the, I forgot I have to talk about this. We're it. not just shit, <laughs> shooting the shit here. Okay, so uh, nine years ago, when I moved out here from North Carolina, um, Charlotte, North Carolina, I was really heavily into like graffiti. Like that was my thing. I was a graffiti writer, you know? Mm -hmm. And I got out here and I was like, I'm going to be a West Coast graffiti writer. I was going to try and join some graffiti crews and go to Seattle and San Francisco and paint. And I got to town and I was just, I was having a rough go at it. I got chased a couple times. Some like random dude saw me when I was out with a buddy. We were walking on Hawthorne and some dude saw me like catch a tag on a, like one, you know, one of those newsstand things. And he chased us down and fucking knocked the shit out of me, knocked me what? to the ground. And called the cops. I ended up hiding underneath a, a truck for like six or seven hours. It was an awful, awful night. Anyways, that all, all that shit happened within like probably like six months moving out here. And I was just like, you know, I was like, I think I was 23 or something. Like, you know, I was starting to enter my mid 20s. And I was like, what the fuck? I'm, you know, kind of reevaluating things. What the fuck am I doing? And I decided to take a step back from graffiti writing, but I still wanted to put my work out on the street, you know? And I ended up, um, you know, seeing all the stickers and stuff all over. Por Portland has a really unique sticker scene, mm -hmm. especially street art, but, like, stickers in particular seem to be, like, a very prominent thing here. I'm sure you guys know a little bit about that. But, um, yeah, I was like, I, I could do that. So I made some little characters and drew them on some stickers and started putting them up, and I had all these different characters. I had, you know, a clown, I had an owl, and I had this little fucking blob thing that evolved into a whale and i started putting the whale up and i started hanging out with you know the street art crowd and everybody started to notice the whale the whale was kind of like came to the forefront of the characters that i was doing people were like what's up with the whale they were asking me to trade the whale that people were like noticing it and so i gave him a name winston the whale and it just kind of stuck no pun intended but yeah it just kind of kind of stuck and i just kept doing it and it became like, you know, an icon, sort of like RX has his skull. Yeah. You know, you see it, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's stylized. Very distinguishable. Yeah, skull. yeah, yeah. It's may just be a skull, but it's you know, you know it's him. Yeah. Why do you think the whale caught on as opposed to everything all the other stickers? I think that the creators. shape of it had a really nice shape. I would change the faces on him, so like some of them would be like, uh actually I've got some. Do you want me to yeah. Yeah. pull Post them out? out. Real quick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here you guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that the shape of it was really recognizable. You know, it had like has like a nice kind of round. In, you know, your brain immediately. I think with street art, one thing that. Gotcha. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This it. is the whale he's referring to. I think one thing that's important in street art is making something that somebody can see and well, can it can register in their yeah. mind. They can recognize it within a split second. Yeah, it's interesting because yeah. it's vertical. You know, you think of a whale, you think of like probably totally. more of a well, horizontal thing. It started thing. off as a blob. It wasn't a whale at right. first. It was just yeah. this like blob thing. And then I was like, gave him fins and gave him a tail fin and it became a whale, you know? I like the X's for eyes too. And then the different, yeah, the different faces. I see what you're saying. Like yeah, so I would switch the faces eyebrows. up. Sometimes I would write things in the little area where the face was. And yeah, people just recognized that <laughs> and like, yeah, got, you know, it caught on. Look at this business card. Yeah. I this, mean, I can't necessarily your... explain why it's people really cool. latch on to the things that they do. Yeah. Yeah. But well, for whatever reason, that was what kind of stood out amongst the characters that I created. I mean, it's really different because we've talked about this before. A lot of, for some reason, they gravitate, CRs gravitate towards skulls or like death or kind of like a morbid, morbid things, right? Yeah. Um, a whale, though. That's really like no, <laughs> yeah. not a lot of people do that. And the original, my, my originally, like my, my street art campaign name, you know? It wasn't Winston the Whale. Winston the Whale was just a uh, one character in this like whole 
thing that I was project or whatever you want to call it campaign. I called it a campaign of happiness um, because all my characters were really happy and bubbly and um, but it was the lost cause and that wasn't like it wasn't meant as like like it's a lost cause but like I didn't really amongst all this street art that was all trying to communicate these different messages that were all for different causes and kind of activist art and all this mine was just like it had no real direction other than it was just floating happy little things. Well, it doesn't, know? it doesn't seem like, you know, it seems like the audience always kind of chooses what your name's going to be. Like RX goals didn't want to be called RX gold. He wanted to be called RX. Yeah. And then when he started putting up the skulls and, and he was on Flickr and he was labeling them RX skulls. Right. And then he, and then so everyone started calling him RX goals and he had to just accept it. And that yeah. became his name. And who else had a story like that? As if we had we had a few artists on here who've told stories like that. Their names just kind of get, they're given their names. Yeah, I exactly. Yeah. yeah. I definitely came up with the lost cause, but it was, it was kind of a, like a weird default on like, I, you know, I don't really know what my, I don't, I don't have a cause. I don't have like some kind of message I'm trying to send here or something, you know, I didn't, I was lost with that. So, so you started basically in the street art scene, but it seems like you're most known now for your tattooing. Is that right? Yeah. And, uh, you've only been doing it for four years, four and a half years, something like that. About four years. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and, uh, so you started off as, would you, would you call yourself more of an illustrator or more of a street artist? I guess. I mean, at this point, I don't know. I just use the word artist. Gotcha. Just lump it in. I mean, I've partaken in any and every medium and form that, you know, that I could get my hands on that I could progress at. Right. You know? yeah. That seems so, like the right move these days. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I was doing freelance before I was tattooing, and if you're going to freelance, you have to be like kind of a jack of all trades to, yeah. to make ends meet. So, what were right. you freelancing? Man, I was doing murals, illustration, commission paintings. I was actually designing, doing a lot of like tattoo designs for other people to go like get tattooed. Uh -huh. Um, Anything and everything, you know what I mean? I was doing, you know, the, do you know what the do tour is? Yeah. The do tour, the, mm -hmm. it's like X Games kind of thing. Yeah. I did all the artwork for the do tour no one way. year. It was, yeah, it was crazy. It was like seeing all my shit all over, like Ryan Sheckler jumping over my art. It was oh, like, yeah. whoa, crazy. <laughs> I that was that wild. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, stuff for, you know, stuff like that. And then mixed in with murals and logo work and whatever the hell you can get your hands on. Yeah. You know what I mean? So your your style right now, if, for everyone who hasn't seen his tattoo work, it's it's flat. Like you have flat, bright colors. Polygonic. Do we call it polygonic? Yeah. I, I it's just shape, you know. It's a lot of shapes, yeah, I like just geometric it, shapes. I, I, people are always like, "What's the style called?" And I just call it contemporary tattooing. Definitely contemporary, yeah. But it's it's really like it's really well done because it's it's a piece in its own. It's it's flat, but it has dimension. You experiment with some like two three D every now and then where you have uh, like the, the blue and the red. Yeah, the anaglyph. I think that's great. Are you wearing? Is that your shirt that you're wearing? Is that your no, design? no? This is um. This is a guy who goes by Super Freak on Instagram. Yeah, his That's shit's cool. tight. But where do you, where would you say you get a lot of the inspiration for your artwork? Man, I get asked that all the time, and um, I there's no real like quick way to answer it, other we, than everywhere and everything. Mm -hmm. We studied under Cassidy Bell, right? Yes, he. Well, yeah, he taught me initially how to tattoo. Do you like, think you got? He started. He started to teach me, and then. Like, I was doing it, like, n not legitimately at first. And then he kind of, like, backed off and told me I needed to go get my license. And then we okay. resumed education. Okay. We resumed <laughs> it again after I got my license and I went and worked at the shop. But so yes. He, he thought you had it at first or just didn't ask or... Well, he was like, he realized that, you know, I was doing it. He was, it was basically firing in my ass to do it legitimately, to go get my license. So, yeah. And that all started from a stick and poke? that you did for a friend yeah. and and then just someone saw it and was like oh i want that and then no or, i mean i so when i first started tattooing i think i already had eight or nine thousand followers you know i'd already had an artistic career on its way you know i was already building that and um i did it on him and then i turned around and did one on my friend and then did one on a friend the next day and like i posted them and was immediately got emails 
Oh, like okay. People nice. who are following me. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. I'd say within a month of doing that first stick and poke, I was doing them out of my apartment four or five days a week. Wow. Paying rent, doing stick and pokes right how, out the gate. How intricate were the stick and pokes you were doing? They were relatively simple. You, I mean, stick and pokes take a really long time to do. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine a machine moves back and forth, you know, thousands of times, you know, whatever, uh, however fast it moves. So you're doing that one at a time yeah. with your hand. So they take a while. Yeah, I've seen <laughs> yeah, a couple little, of people little tattoo takes three hours, you know. Yeah. Were you doing this, that that really clean shit that you do now when you were doing the stick and poke? It was quite a bit different. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, the tattoo styles evolved quite a bit. Like if you go back like three years, you know, three and a half years, you, you can, it's, it's quite a bit different. Gotcha. But then once it jumped into the color stuff, like there's no turning back, man. It what do you mean? Yeah, it, well, it's so like, unique. Like how did you get into the colors? Like... I know a lot of people, at least artists, it's hard to break into colors because it's such a science. Yeah, and and like I'm man, I am still very much a baby. I feel like I am <clears throat> well, I feel like I'm always going to be learning, but I feel like color is it's complicated with tattoos and it doesn't always work with all of all lo- like placement locations. Not every spot is going to, you know, you're going to be able to, skin is different from your front of your arm to your back of your arm even, right? So applying color over just any skin type or any placement, it's not always going to work. It depends on also the complexion or like the skin tone of the person, you know? Um, There's all kinds of factors. There's all kinds of variables that can really change it. And it's been... It's been a roller coaster, man, but um, you know, I'm just trying to stick with it. There's sometimes when I really just want to give up on doing color work and just like do I feel like I'm on vacation when I do a like a black ink tattoo. <laughs> yeah. It literally feels like I'm just like on a beach, just like, oh yeah, this is so easy. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes like I'm kinda like, Why am I doing this to myself? You know, like but I love it at the end of the day and I love I love color too much to give it up. Color elicits emotion, you know what I mean? Like a nice cool tone is calming and a nice warm tone kind of, uh, you know, it has energy and it kind of like gets you feeling good. So I don't know. I I don't really want to give that up. I, it makes me feel too good. Yeah. When you do color, like let's say if you did a gradient, do you... Do you like mix it like before? Like if it starts shifting, do you? Mix well, I have the color? some colors that I I have like a color set uh-huh. that I kind of. Like, if you look at my work, there's some some kind of go tos. Mm-hmm. You know the red, orange, yellow with the light blue, um, the rainbow stuff. You know the teal with the orange. Those I already have those colors. You know they're already in, mixed in bottles. I, you know I buy them as is. Uh-huh. But then if I am making a gradient, that's like subtle tones kind of changing shifting i will i'll mix them to kind of match that to get that gradient right yeah so that it's you know so it doesn't look like you know some random green next to some completely different green you know I'll mix a little bit of the one next to it in with the one next to it to kind of get that get them to look similar so if it's like two solids you just kind of start going lighter like if you have yellow on one side and blue on the other side and you want it to go like great and i'm just nerding out right now on light colors mm-hmm. but do you kind of like start bolder and then go light as you go to the blue and then kind of go bold on the blue and go light towards the yellow and just kind of go like up to do I mean, a gradient? I guess, I guess if I was doing a like orange to yellow gradient and then a dark blue to light blue, yeah, I would do that. Yeah. yeah. That's how I would do it. I guess it depends on depends on the color composition. It doesn't require like a lot more <clears throat> ink when you're doing color. I mean, when you're doing as much solid saturation as the stuff that I do yeah, I use quite a bit. Yeah. 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 This is kind of new to me, so that's why I'm like picking your brand. Like yeah, I'm not necessarily texture. like, you know, I guess they call it whip shading, shading it out, like blending colors and stuff like that, which might use a little bit less. I mean, doing like this really solid fill. So, yeah. Whip I go shading, through. is that what's... Yeah. yeah, that's just a technique that's used for getting those like nice soft blends, you know, do they just kind of like go up and out, like as they like like release from the skin as you like pressure or no pressure? Is that what whip shading is? What do you mean? Like if you're pressing down, do you kind of go up from the needle to the skin? Oh yeah, I guess you're talking about the movement. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so you got a a pretty big following for a tattoo artist in Portland. I feel like um, 
how, how did you blow up? <laughs> to put it really frankly, man. So what happened was, see what had happened was, I was uh, the 3D tattoos. I did I did one 3D tattoo and it immediately got like a a response. Like I I got a bunch of likes on it, and got a bunch of emails about doing 3D tattoos. So I started doing those more often, and I got hit up. It was totally out of the blue. I was kind of like, "What the fuck? This is crazy." But um, I forget if it was. I think it was Huffington Post hit me up first. Really? <laughs> yeah. How did they get a hold of you? Or how did they how did they hear about you? Do you know? I don't know. You know the internet, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I mean, I already had a decent following and gotcha. stuff. Gotcha. When was when? How long ago was that? That was what three years ago. Gotcha. I wasn't that even that far into tattooing yet. You yeah. Know? It was like one year in. Yeah, it was like so. what? okay, uh, but um, yeah, they That's hit awesome, me. Though. Yeah, it was it was a honestly it was a blessing, man. But um, they hit me up to do an interview, like an e- uh, email interview, um, and I obliged. You're good. Okay. That was fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and uh, that got posted, and it immediately my shit just like you know my following got boosted, and then. BuzzFeed hit me up, and then I did another interview with BuzzFeed. Hell yeah. So it was like two like major media outlets, like yeah. online media outlets hit me up. Massive followings for both of them. And then that like that ended up like kind of uh, going viral and got shared on, I th- there was a couple others. MTV.com reposted the interview. Nice. Teen Vogue reposted the interview. Nice. It just went all over the place. The BuzzFeed one and specifically? Then, or, or I, I don't remember them. which one oh, it okay, was, yeah. but they were all over. The interviews were on Reddit and shit, like got bumped up and on the, I don't know how Reddit works, but apparently, yeah. you know, they the got bumped up. Votes. They, yeah. Upvoted. They got, yeah. yeah, it got bumped up. That's awesome. People were like sending me screenshots from Reddit. Some kid in Italy sent me a picture. Um, it somehow made it to some news station in Italy and he sent me a picture of me on the news in Italy. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? That's wow. awesome. What? And it yeah, it just went viral. It went everywhere. People are like acting like they had never seen three D I guess maybe people haven't seen three D tattoos before. I certainly was not the first person to do them. Okay, so explain three D tattoos for people who don't know them. It's red and blue. Like you know, you know, like your your classic, like your old comic books with the red and blue. It's called anaglyph, is what the like technical mm-hmm. term for it is. It's where you um, you overlap two images, or I think it's actually technically three, but you know, pops off when you wear the red and blue glasses. What I'm doing isn't necessarily a true anaglyph. I'm doing it more so just it it looks cool. It's an effect. You know, Does it the, work? Or doesn't no. pop off the skin. Oh, okay. No. If, if, you have, if you have glasses, if you have people try to do that, like put the yeah, glasses no, on. Yeah, no, it looks trippy, okay. but it doesn't like it doesn't like jump off your skin. Gotcha. But to be fair, those weren't the best like 3D kind of glasses anyways, you know what I mean? The red and blue ones? Yeah, it's like even when you wore them, it it was kind of tricking your eyes, but it wasn't it was just weird. It looked weird. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was the most basic the version of the The tattoos definitely like technique. definitely look crazy through the glasses. Yeah. Yeah, they look trippy, but um yeah, they don't necessarily pop off, but uh, but yeah, that's that's what the 3D tattoos are. What about remember those old ones, like the books that you'd put close to your eyes? Yeah, I was thinking about that guy. too. The magic eye, yeah, like yeah. Could, could you make a magic eye tattoo? I think if you tried to tattoo a magic eye design, it would just be like a turn into like a weird blob, like after it healed. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it would just be like it just looks like distortion almost already. Gotcha. You, yeah, you wouldn't really be able to do it. God, that'd be an interesting experiment. That would be. If you could do a magic eye tattoo. I'm sure somebody's tried, man. Man, that everybody's tried every. Well, everybody's yeah. tried everything nowadays. Are cheap, yeah. You get, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be IKEA. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. Called it. He's called. Dave's called everything since he's gotten on here. Called yeah, the, no, he's ar- the arsonist had oddly shaped feet and uh, <laughs> yeah, primal scheme. His friends being ridiculously good looking. Yeah, we talked about this. Andre, you're out there. We can all agree <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So do you ever, um, have you experienced like a burnout or how do you overcome that? I mean, we, oh we talked, yeah. God, Especially because yeah, you're dude. probably being slammed with tattoo stuff and like, do you have time for, uh, this is 80 questions at once, we're going to burn you out with the questions. <laughs> <Yeah. you>. <laughs> <laughs> do you still have time for your, your I'm other having stuff, an anxiety or? attack as we speak. <laughs> I'm, yeah. So- Got enough water there. Cortisol okay, is pumping through my veins right now. No, but yeah. So how do you how do you handle the overload of work? Yeah, well, so I went really hard the first couple years. Like, 
nonstop. I was traveling. I was just going for it, you know, which was awesome and it was good. I, I think I developed, it helped with my development, you know, to kind of like expedite my development. But it was last like October, I started to kind of feel it and I was like, I was just, it was like opening up my email would just, I would immediately have an anxiety attack. Just even just opening up Gmail would just send me into like this spiral. And Damn. I just wasn't able to compartmentalize myself from the communication part of tattooing to the creative part of tattooing. I wasn't able to be like, like the, you know, weed through all of the stuff that I was getting. And I was doing this thing where people would submit their ideas and I would open up my books, you know, and I wouldn't post my email, you know, for months and then be like, on this day, at this time, I'm going to open, you know, I'm opening up my books. And I would post my email. And I, one time I, I like opened it and like my phone was going off. And I was like, I just was like, I'll just turn the notifications off. I'll check back in like 30, 40 minutes. And I think in 40 minutes, I got 180 emails. Holy shit. And I was like, I immediately took my email down. Yeah, uh, and immediately it was just like, "What the fuck?" And I, I, had, it was out of that 180, I think a little over 100 people submitted ideas. So I had like 100 emails, and these aren't just emails to read; these are people spilling their fucking guts, like really intimate stuff. In some of them, some of them damn. are just like, "I want a cool tiger," but then some yeah. of them are like, "This is their like story, and this tattoo needs to encompass this story." Damn. And reading that shit is emotionally draining. I bet. It's exhausting. And I got, Jeez. I just got way burnt out on doing that. And at first I really enjoyed it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I get to engage with these people on this level. You know, I get to like, you kind of get to know people on this like kind of deeper level when you're doing that. And that's really interesting. And it engages you with your clientele in a way that's, you don't get doing most art. You know what I mean? When you sell a painting to somebody that intimacy, maybe that connection between what they're experiencing through the art and what you, how you made the art and how that all translates back and forth. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's different with tattooing. You're, that's all right there front and center and you're having that conversation and that's awesome. But when you're doing that, it's at a, at an extremely high volume. It takes a little piece of you every time Every time you have that conversation, every time you write back that email, every time you send somebody a finished design and they've got a lot of expectation, you know, um, it wears on you. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're getting personally involved and you only got so much energy. Very personally involved. Yeah. Yeah. And I pretty much hit a wall last like October and just spiraled into like some of the most insane depression and anxiety that I've ever had in my life. It was like shit, like I would be just standing there and I would just break down and have to like lay on the floor and just cry for no reason at all. And that's when I I, I uh, deactivated my Instagram. I canceled some appointments that I had for the upcoming month or two. And I just went into self-care mode, you know. I seeked help and um, I did what I had to do, you know to to get out of it and um kind of had to take a step back and reevaluate how am what am I doing that caused that you know what what can I do for this to be more sustainable for me on like a mental health level and so that's when I decided that's when I stopped doing custom work um very soon after that and now I only do flash I only draw what I want to draw and people get to choose whatever I have, whatever I've been drawing for that period of time, you know, it's always changing. And it's, and I hired an assistant. She does all my emails. It all gets filtered through her. Um, Perfect. I, uh, I stopped, like, I stopped engaging in DMs as much as I used to. Like, I used to really, like, an, you know, answer people and talk to people through DMs. I stopped doing that. I just basically put, all of that at arm's length so that I could, when I wake up, I can create, I can draw and I don't have to, I don't have to, um, shift gears, which for me, shifting gears isn't like, Oh, I did some emails time to draw. I'm like, I did some emails time to go in my room and like shake and like have an anxiety attack and then not draw for two days because I have to like decompress out of that. 
This is a recurring thing that we've been hearing. Yeah, but I, and I think this is even better when, that you're bringing it up because we, we have a lot of people that come on here that are on their way, I think, to being you know, at your level. And they're still answering their DMs personally and all that stuff. Mm, and yeah. and they and I mean and it's good to hear that you it's okay to hire an assistant. You or you got you kinda gotta let someone else do it at that point. Yeah, but in the beginning, to, when you're on your way, you're taking every opportunity that comes at you because you've been in survival mode. I was in survival mode before that. Right. To me, an email was like could mean the Money. difference of like a six months of income. Yeah, you know what gotcha. I mean? Okay, yeah. So it's like when you're when you're coming out of that kind of mindset, then everything you see and like every tattoo that request that I would get, I'd be like, oh, this is an opportunity, you know? And at a certain point, I just had to be like, there are so many opportunities. Like, it's okay to say no. It's right. okay to pick and choose. Right. And I guess yeah. that's, I'm sending that message mainly to the people who are already full time. Yeah. They're already supporting themselves full time. Right. They're not in survival mode anymore, but right. they're still answering their, right. all, all their DMs. But in their personally. head, they're still in survival mode. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 But how do you, I mean, what point do you have to have a breakdown or can you avoid the breakdown if you have the information ahead of time, maybe? I well, don't so know. So one thing that really fucked me up was I was talking about doing those submissions, you know, get all those requests. And so I only had, would have 20, 30 spots available to, to do request work, you know? And over so, what period of time? You know, over like three, four months. Got to, okay, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. or three months or however long. I were, My booking cycle was, I think I maxed out at three months. I don't like uh -huh. to book out further than that. Gotcha. Um, and um, the rest, you have to say no to. That's a lot of no's. So I would try my best to word it and like let them down gently, you know, because like they took the time to write me this really intimate thing. I'm going to take the time to at least tell them that like that I, I can't do it this time, you know, without disappointing them. And so I would do that. And then I would get this whole wave of people that would send me these really bummed out, like, oh man, you'd like I had my whole year planned around this, or like, man, I like I I you know, I put a lot of thought into that. I can't believe you said no. And that woo getting that kind of shit hurts even stings even worse, yeah. man. You're like fuck you know that feeling of i just disappointed this person like i don't want to disappoint people that sucks yeah yeah and you know it's just about um i hate this i hope i'm not sounding like a bummer here um because i love my job and i love what i do but there there are some parts of it that require a lot of compartmentalization to be sustainable with doing it not at all, man. That's yeah. just something that we constantly try to remind people. You know, uh, it's a reality. You do, it is a reality. Yeah, yeah, you got you do have to compartmentalize. I mean, we we try to pay attention to successful people and 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 see their habits and what they do, and they all got they all compartmentalize in some way or another. They all have people to do the things that they don't have the time to do, so they can focus on what it is they do best. And like, why like people like you because of your art. You don't want to do too much to take away from your capability to right. do that art. It's 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 like you got to communicate to people that like okay, if I give and give and give and give, eventually I'm going to be empty and I'm a not going to create stuff that you guys like and b I'm not going to be able to even create period because um, my uh, emotional capacity is is drained. I'm gone. I'm done. Right. Yeah. And emo uh, for me at least creating art is it is an emotional and like a spiritual experience you know it's i put a lot of of thought and effort and i put my soul into what i do i care a lot about it i it's the thing i care the most about i'd say in my life <laughs> mm -hmm. that's how it should be yeah i mean i i always kind of told myself that like art is like art is like the girlfriend that i'm like i'm never gonna it's never not gonna she's never not gonna be there she's always there like even when she's not around, like she comes back around. Yeah. I think that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a relationship. Yeah. And it's a relationship with yourself, really. I yeah. Mean, you learn a lot about yourself. With through. your mind. Oh my God. It's a weird relationship with your mind. And it's yeah. weird because like when you see yourself um, not enjoying it, you got to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Because you should be able to enjoy it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I think that... <sighs> So what, one thing that I've been really practicing lately is, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of mindfulness. Yeah. 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 So mindfulness has played a big role in 
my creative process these days, and it's it's had a big influence in the direction that I go in with my work these days. And one thing that it's taught me is it teaches you to not judge, you know, to not judge thing uh, something maybe you deem a good feeling, a good feeling, rather than just recognizing as the feeling that it is. Or a bad feeling is, I don't want that feeling because it's bad, right? And I think that uh, trying to always tell myself that art is supposed to be feel good and it's supposed to be happy, but that's just not... Sometimes it's a struggle and sometimes it's really tough and that's just part of the process. That doesn't mean that anything wrong is happening. That doesn't mean that I'm doing something bad to cause that struggle and that challenge. It's just part of the process. And letting go of that judgment has helped me navigate my way through creating quite a bit. Because I used to be like, oh, I can't figure this out. I can't get this design right or something. Like, what's going, what's wrong with me? And like, you know, judge yourself, shame yourself. Like, oh man, I'm fucking up. Like, I don't know what's going on. And now I just move through the struggle and it's a struggle, no doubt. But I'm moving through it and I'm not fighting it. It reminds me a little bit of like the wabi sabi theory, where even though totally. there's imperfections, you need to embrace those imperfections and you can almost build off them. And that's what makes it unique. Totally. Fucking Bob Ross, man. Put a happy little, happy God, little that's accident. That's what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. I like where you're going with this mindfulness thing. I mean, how, what kind of tips? I want to go deeper into it, like for other artists to hear this too, because I think that's really important, not only for artists, but just for people in general. Life. Yeah, yeah, like let's just talk about it. Like, what are some examples of like something that you've you've experienced where mindfulness made it easier? I'd say navigating emotions because yeah. there's the the tendency to when a bad feeling or emotion comes up to immediately recognize it as good or bad. And I experience a lot of anxiety, and what I started doing was. Whenever it comes up, I kind of just tell myself, like, okay, like, we're here. This is what we're doing. We're having an anxiety attack right now. And I kind of go into my body and I look for where it's located. Where is it? Is it in my stomach? Is it in my chest? Are my hands trembling? And I just sit with those physical sensations and, ha and have, have them, just let them happen without going, I need to go do this to alleviate my anxiety i need to i need to go for a walk or something i just sit with it really yeah and it sucks sometimes no doubt it's not like i'm like oh i'm sitting with anxiety and it's fine no i'm having a fucking anxiety attack and i'm freaking out but i'm not trying i'm not trying to close it off yeah so when you cl when you do close it off you find that it makes it worse oh like my God. it's way yeah. worse yeah cuz it's anxiety for me a lot of times has no explanation. It just happens. Maybe sometimes it can be explained. Maybe something, there's some catalyst, you know, that kind of brought me there. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have a, I can't pinpoint it. Yeah. So how long could you sit there experiencing this until? I don't know. Yeah, it could be random. It just depends. Time's got to be hard to keep track of when that's yeah, going on. Yeah, it's circumstantial, right? yeah. So, but I mean, I do these yeah. things where I do body scans throughout the day. I kind of like, I do it when I'm driving. I do it when I'm taking a shower. I do it when I'm eating. I started, I started tasting my food more. Like, just trying to, like, what is this? That's kind of like a mindfulness exercise, right? Yeah, yeah, what does this sweet potato really taste like? What does it feel like in my mouth? You know, how does it, how's it making me feel right now? You know? And yeah. It's really simple, and it sounds really silly, but it's, like, just doing those little, integrating it in, like, little bits into your lifestyle and your daily routine. For me, at least, it's, it's helped. And I, you know, there are days where I go throughout the whole day, and my mind is going crazy, and I'm just deep in thought, and I don't really practice it but there are days where i every thought i have what i'm doing is trying to separate myself from that thought and observe it in a non-judgmental way so it's you know it oscillates you know depending on what i've got on my plate but but it's helped a lot there's a lot of times when like i'm a i'm a pretty like active person and if i go like a whole day without doing something active i start getting weird mm -hmm. so I'll run, yeah. And I, but I'm starting to think maybe that, like, I think that's good, but then sometimes maybe it's not what I should be doing. Maybe if I start getting weird, maybe I should, like, accept it. 
<laughs> like it, like you say, experience it and just accept it for what it is. Yeah. But then there's also on the other side of the token, like sometimes when you run or you do something so physical, it, it helps puts you, you in that zone. Yeah, it yeah. helps you forget it puts you in that about flow state. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, you know, I also think that like humans should be active and we should be doing things and maybe it's like an adverse reaction to sitting all day. I mean, I think that what you're talking about sounds like a very healthy coping mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being active is for me at least I I started I started going to the gym more in like the last year and that's also been a big part of my you know, my mental health, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and I started and do you, do you run? Yeah. Do you run outside or do you run on a treadmill? I do both. Like, yeah. Like this morning, I woke up at like five a.m. and ran on the treadmill for a while. Do you ever get like the the runner's high? You ever get that endorphin release? When I just like wow, yeah. I'm when I get off it. the treadmill, I will have more energy than before I was on the treadmill. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The days when I go to the gym versus when I don't, my days when I go to the gym are way. I'm way more. I'm sharper. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like it, it makes sense. You're literally like releasing chemicals in your brain. You know, it's it makes sense. Do you enjoy that running and stuff, or do you? <laughs> I, do you hate I'm it? not gonna lie. Like, I hate running. Like, because it was always <laughs> uh, growing up, running was always a form of punishment in all the sports I played. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, right. you guys suck. Go run. And I was like, ah, oh, I hate it. It's Get not, your cardio in. And it it's not fun. Like, it's not fun for me. It might be fun for a lot I, okay, of people. Okay, so it's I got. Not fun. No, this I like this because I'm kind of the opposite. Where like I like running a lot, and I don't like weightlifting as much. Oh, look at us! Is that yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell? Yeah. No, but um, but I've noticed that like, where's Andre at? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, right. I started running all the time, and then I was I got to a point where I was like running more and more, and then I was running for like ninety minutes a day, uh, maybe not a day, but every time I went running, which was most days, yeah, I'd run for ninety minutes. And I, was, I started to realize, like, wait, this is starting to, like, have the opposite effect I want. I am running too much. I don't have as much energy for other shit. I, there's no need for me to be this good at running. I am not. It's not my job. Right. I don't need to. I'm, I'm not, like, trying to survive <laughs> out in the wilderness or anything. And I was like, I, maybe I should spend this time lifting weights, which I don't like doing as much. And I would do that, and I would just, like, it would help my brain function better to yeah. even it out. So I think whatever, I think it's just, you know, being active is really important because you got you need to strengthen your body to help strengthen your mind. Absolutely. Like, it, it makes a huge difference. Like and you also were just tattooing saying. and art. I mean, I'm just sitting there all day. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, we do all I, kinds of computer work, so we're uh, and podcasting and stuff. We're on our butts all the time, dude. I've got some back pain going on right now. Some lower back pain, dude. It's are you spasming. Are you getting the spasms? It's fucked Ugh. up. I've been to the chiropractor twice. I got a cupping done recently. I've been two massages. I'm just like, it's totally fucked. Dude, but. I'll, I'll show you some <laughs> core stuff after the podcast. Okay, yeah, core yeah. strengthening is huge. Yeah. And the other thing is. I'll, uh, most back pro- a lot of back problems I think can be tied to mental stuff not necessarily like and it's never like oh I have depression so I have a back problem oh, I shouldn't say never sometimes it is yeah but I really I really think there's this guy John Sorno I think his name is John Sorno um, but he wrote this book called like mind over back problems or something like that <laughs> and uh, uh, but no but it's like it's helped so many people and this guy literally just basically tells people like your back problems in your mind and he's healed like thousands of people that oh, way. oh I've heard yeah. of stuff like this yeah I, I yeah I, I I don't know I'm indifferent. I don't about think it. can I get like a private appointment with this guy? Can well, they, yeah, kind of, no, kind of, they kind of hypnotize. Actually. They kind of like hypnotize your issues yeah. away from you. It's not, even, it's not even hypnosis. I mean, it kind of is. It kind of is. But I read okay. I read the book and yeah. or most of it, and I was like, I didn't like it. I was because for me, reading is not a great way for me to like learn a healing technique. Mm-hmm. I needed. I need someone to walk me through it sure. for sure. Mm-hmm. But I also went to chiropractor, physical therapist everybody i had like spiritual people doing weird shit on me like i tried for everything back for back pain literally everything uh, drugs everything the only thing that helped was fucking forgetting about it like i started to do so much other stuff and i started to just Man, exercise I, you know I, i've been thinking about this too and it's been a good chance for me to kind of engage in some mindfulness because i'm like i'm trying to think like is this pain something that i'm labeling in my mind as like bad and like pain so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ha- have back pain. And I've done that a couple of times. I'm like, no, nope, this sucks. You know, I'm like, get up. And I'm like, no, my body hurts. And I don't know. I don't know how to navigate that. Well, yeah. for, for me, don't know. 
for me, it wasn't like I didn't tell myself I didn't have a problem. I just decided to focus on other stuff. Yeah, because I was like, what What can I do? What's that it? helps? Yeah, yeah, it's like what is it not debilitating? I find me that from? when I'm up and out and doing things where I'm like physically engaged in other stuff, it's not there. So I'm yeah, sitting exactly. there and I'm just yeah. like, oh, there it is, you know. And I'm like, wait. Is that just because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about it, or is that because it's actually there? Like, well, it's the f- there a little bit when I'm out doing stuff, but it's not, f- it's not front and center in my attention. Yeah. Well, on, yeah. The, on, the, on the physiological side of things, sitting is supposed to be one of the worst things you can do oh, fuck. for that. Yeah. So that makes sense. That makes sense even just on that on that front that it's getting worse when you're sitting. But yeah. But for sure, I'm because I, I was I was pretty fucked up by it, and then. Now I'm the thinking truth. about it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry, I started doing tattoos standing up now. <laughs> like, Actually, some, that some people, sucks. It hurts. It hurts way worse. Because are you like bending really? over? You're kind of. Over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Having that support when you're sitting to yeah actually helps a lot. You need to suspend them and lie back. But I got this like <laughs> I got this fucking lumbar brace that I'm gonna start wearing when I tattoo. And oh really? I got this like posture corrector brace that I'm gonna wear at home now. I'm like. That can help, but cool. then at the same time, you don't want to let my that weaken Amazon, your muscles. My Amazon yeah. order list is just getting more and more like... Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> like the recommendations I get sometimes now are like, yeah. what, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. What's yeah. happening How to me How screwed here? up am I? Yeah. <laughs> so I got a question for you. When you were taking the photo, you were mentioning how... Um, I, 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 we talked about your tattoos. You're know, like, some are good experiences, some are bad experiences. Like, Do you want to talk about that? It's, I would rather not talk about the bad ones just because I don't want to like, I don't want to like. Throw shade. Exactly. I don't want to, you know, obviously the yeah. image could be linked to the person who did it. But I've oh, had, okay, okay. yeah, I've had for, some bad ones enough. for sure. I think anybody who's heavily tattooed has had some bad experiences. I wasn't sure if they were like based off a time that was dark and that's why you got it. No. That's kind of what I was thinking. They're more about. like the the person who was doing the tattoos. Oh, really? Weird interactions or something or. Yeah. What okay, and then like what do you think is but most important? Of them are, are great. What most. do you think is important for tattoo artists to have characteristic wise when they are tattooing so they don't have bad experiences? Oh, just a little understanding of what's happening on the client side, you know what I mean? Like yeah. not being so I I think a lot of people hold on to the hardness of tattooing and like the kind of like you know, the the attitude behind tattooing. Yeah. But um that's not a fun thing to be treated that way when you're really... I mean, getting tattooed, you're putting a lot of trust in the person who's doing the tattoo. And... It seems like an outdated attitude, too. It It's it's becoming... Yeah, it's slowly but surely. It's definitely as, as like we it, we enter this like kind of mainstream thing with tattooing. I think a lot of people are realizing like, oh, that doesn't work. And people are like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. You know, but there's still plenty of it out there. Tattoo breeds... Tattoo culture breeds ego. Like it... A lot of people's egos are inflated, you know, um, but it's changing for sure. But um, I think that, yeah, just treat the person how you would want to be treated. Maybe some people want to be treated like that, but I, I don't know. I try to treat my clients with dignity and, you know, and respect. And and it's talking about a tattoo can be a negotiation, you know, and if there's a boundary set that boundary and be transparent about it and don't be a dick about it you know it's okay to have boundaries as a as an artist but just communicate that shit yeah just be clear about it people will appreciate it when i set my boundaries with my clients they understand and they're willing to listen and i've had experiences where maybe they had boundaries but they're not telling me that and they're just assuming that i'm going to accept whatever's happening as it's you know, as it's happening. And that can be really tough when you're, you're kind of in the dark with what, what does this person want? And like, what are they doing? Why are they acting this way towards me? Am I, did I do something wrong? You know, cause there's just complete lack of communication a lot of times. Yeah. A lot of times it's, it's in the art world. If you get commissioned, it's like, well, I'm paying you to do what I want. And Gage mural artist, he, he would like walk out of, projects halfway through he's like screw this i don't i don't deserve to be treated like this no i'm not desperate yeah and you're treating me like i am desperate right what you say about boundaries i mean i think that's a great message just for like ethics in general yeah everyone should treat each other like you said the way they want to be treated inside business a lot of people a lot of times people get so caught up 
in the money aspect, like, well, I'm paying for this, or but it's not, it shouldn't be like that. Like, we yeah. should be people. It's like, yeah, we're paying for each other's services, but you don't have to be so monetarily driven yeah. all the time. Right. I think that goes uh, on both ends. Yeah. From the client and the artist perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, a great point. Mick, Mick Monster was just talking about that last week about how some he would go to shows and he'd make way more money than everyone else there with his cheaper pieces. And people would be like, How are you making so much money? Why is everyone buying your stuff? And he's like, Because I'm charging way less. I'm charging a 15th of what you're charging. And it's like, I know that what you did took as long as it, what I did. You know, yeah. like, He's just not being arrogant about it, right? And and I think you know you gotta you gotta charge the right amount. You don't want you, I don't really don't think you should belittle your own work and like undercharge for your time because it's important. But at the same time, you don't have to be like, I want fifteen hundred dollars for this when it took you like a couple hours. To you know, do. I, I've like gotten shit from some tattooers in the last like year about not charging enough. They're like, oh man, because you're lowering the market or well, just because um, they, you know what i'm doing people deem as like this like really unique thing you know like each piece i'm creating is like this unique thing so it's not like it's it's a it's a specialty product that i'm selling i guess so to speak if you want to call it a product i don't know because you got your own certain style and you're designing all your own yeah tattoos yeah and um that is worth a lot in the tattoo industry having a unique style sets you apart and that's really difficult to accomplish in tattooing to set yourself apart because there's so much of kind of this recycled kind of style and a lot of it you know a lot of this stuff that you know is is done a lot is done really well but sometimes when you line them all up you can't tell the difference of who's who even if it's done really nicely it's still there's the style is not there and so uh i i think that i charge what I feel happy, content with what I charge, and I feel like it's already high enough. But according to some people, it should be more. And I'm like, I, I just don't feel, I don't know. I just don't feel like it's worth any more than what I'm already doing. And I exclude a whole demographic of people that I might potentially have good connections with and like get along with really well working, you know, I'm sitting with them for three, four hours at a time, you know, I'd if that means that I need to target a wider group of people by not charging maybe quite as much as some of these higher end tattooers think a tattoo is worth, then that's okay. But I think that tattooing is, uh, pricing is so subjective and it's all across the board. It's crazy how broad the, the spectrum of pricing works in tattooing. There is no standard. There's no such thing as a standard in tattooing anymore, at least. Maybe once upon a time there was. But now, with the internet, with things like, uh, you know, Instagram numbers are deemed as like a status thing, right? Yeah. And people kind of put price tags on that stuff, you know? Uh, and I get it. Supply and demand makes sense, you know? But it's all over the place. I I honestly don't really, I, I kind of have just been doing what I've been doing for a while, my pricing, you know? And I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know where it's at now. It's been changing a lot very quickly. I'm hearing numbers about other people, what other people are charging, and I'm like, holy shit, that's a, that seems like a lot to me. But it's like it, the market is inflated now. Yeah, that's all over the place. Well, I mean, there's like the two ends you could play. Do you play uh, a reasonably priced work and you get a lot, or do you charge more and then you have more free time but you're making the same amount of money? Yeah, I mean, the theory is that coming from a lot of other tattooers in regards to my work is that it doesn't matter if I if I aim high. I'm still going to get the same amount of work. Um, but I don't know. Well, if you're working... I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I feel okay. I'm confident in what I'm doing, and I feel okay with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm making ends meet, and I'm happy, and I'm able to do what I do, and I'm grateful for that. I, I'd say more than anything right at this point, uh, I just experience a lot of gratitude for what i'm able to do oh yeah yeah it's that's amazing good. yeah no that's great i mean i feel like if your gut's telling you you're charging the right price you're probably charging the right price and, i feel like okay with it yeah and maybe yeah. A, unless you get like a manager who you were 100 percent sure is way smarter than you at that stuff and tells you you need to up your price like why <laughs> why change it yeah you know yeah 
Yeah, maybe in like a, a year or two, I'll reevaluate. But right now, I'm I'm fine, man. And who knows? The market might change in a year or two drastically. Yeah, yeah. you know. I'm like, I'm just waiting for the fucking Instagram time bomb to tick right? out. Right, right. Dude, yeah. we talk <laughs> yeah. about that. Yeah. Like, when is it going to happen? We just go, well, there's no I, other service. I feel like it's, well, I feel like it's starting to happen. It's so ever saturated. Since, ever since Facebook, it got bought by Facebook. It got bought the, by Facebook eight years ago. Yeah, but like it seems like more than ever, the algorithms are just screwing it up, dude. Yeah, and it pisses us off. Yeah, there's just no alternative right now. I'm seeing some guys out there, some artists out there, guys and girls, um, and everybody else. Yeah, yeah, thank you. nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm seeing a lot of people out there, uh, who I think are amazing, and they're doing these beautiful tattoos and they're not getting the engagement you know i can see that they're that that the algorithm is working against them i can see it and i can see them doing this thing you know you see people post on their story it'll be a picture of the tattoo with a little scribble over and say new post they're trying to get direct people to the post to like it and comment on it Mm -hmm. and it bums me the fuck out man it bums me that that's happening because like i'm missing posts from people because of that shit yeah you know i'm Mm -hmm. not seeing them because Instagram is not letting me see them. Yeah. Fuck that shit. I feel like the same thing happened with YouTube. The people who really got a good following on YouTube, got their channel built up. They're kind of unstoppable right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like the momentum is there. Yeah. Yeah. You can't really beat them. Yeah. Uh, Snapchat's not really taking off any further than it has. It's kind of plateaued. Facebook's just a shitty news source. Well, this (laughs) isn't this all like kind of an analogous to the economy? Because the economy hit a a block this year. It's like it couldn't go up anymore. Hmm. And it's been tanking. Like like stocks, bonds, like no matter what you invested in, it, literally everything went down this year. Uh, and obviously, cryptocurrency fucking crashed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I've noticed that along with that, the channels that we have available to us for advertisement have gotten narrower and narrower. And the people at the top are just becoming more famous. And the and the little indie guys can't market. There's no ab- good avenues for indie marketing. You, yeah, you have to like it, if you didn't have hop to on the bandwagon like years ago. Right. You're fucked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. kind of what happens is that, you know, you, you, you take a stab at something, whether it's informed or not, and it either takes off or it doesn't. And the things that take off, take off, and the other things don't. And then it becomes this, like, bottleneck where it's like, oh, if you were in at the right time, you're going to be seen. Right. And if you're not, it's too late. There's no way for you. So I think right now, Gorilla I, I mean, I'm happy that I was in the time and place where I was at when Instagram was kind of shifting into what it is now. But right. goddamn, it's crazy now. And it's also... In regards, not even in necessarily regards to like the algorithm and like the platform itself, but the level of like talent out there and the rate at which people are able to to reach their potential because they're exposed to so much just amazing stuff, all the content all the time. I see people fucking year into tattooing and they're just like nailing it because they're able to see everything and like observe it and learn from it and it's allowing people to progress way faster than they were too which is adding to like the exponential rate of like the saturation that's happening of the saturation of talent and of of availability of of getting like good cool tattoos and cool art it's just too much it's too saturated it's insane and i'm like the bubble is gonna burst eventually right well you see a lot of people who are just deleting accounts and that's kind of a trend right now where people are just stopping social media altogether. Right? Really? Especially yeah. Facebook, Who? obviously. Definitely yeah. Facebook. Well, yeah. just, just well people. Facebook is... Facebook yeah, shit. doesn't serve the same purpose that it once did. Oh, at not all. at all. No. Yeah. No, it doesn't seem like yeah. it, at least. But, yeah. But I think it's more of like a mental health thing. People are stopping social media because it is giving them anxiety and it's just they want to feel more free in life and... Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's nice. It feels like a vacation when you disengage. It's yeah. yeah. And it's funny because it's, it's mm-hmm. funny because it's like it takes away the two things that are good for you, which are like actual social interactions and learning to be happy with yourself. Yeah. You can't do either oh my when you're God. on social media. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, the, the like constant comparison yeah. that you're making. Yeah. And I, I listened to some podcasts. It was either Hidden Brain. I think it was Hidden Brain or it was Invisibilia, one of those, you know. Um, and they were talking about 
um, you know, breaking it down from like a, a psychology level of like what's happening to kids and their ability to actually have a good time or engage in whatever they're doing because of what social media has done to them and robbed them of their own like ability to just be like they could be sitting on a pristine beach, but they're on Instagram mm-hmm. feeling like they missed out on their friend's birthday party or something. You know, yeah. well, it's just, like they it don't just, even really get to enjoy what's right in front of them because FOMO, it amplifies FOMO oh, man. in a it weird way. Yeah. 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 And of course, everyone's lives on social media is fake. Yeah. You only it's only the, the squeaky exterior good. of what, you know, you really want to reveal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not like on the toilet, like I had diarrhea today or something, you know. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I see this. I, yeah. I not that I that's not gonna, necessarily a great right. example, but. <laughs> it's like I see some people on social media like look really happy and stuff. And I know that they're like going through a divorce and yeah. shit. Yeah. It's like, dude, yeah. you are not enjoying life. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, true. what are you doing? Why yeah. are you sending this? It's funny when you actually message. know what's going on in somebody's life, and then you see what oh, they're doing yeah, on social media, yeah. and you're like, "Yeah, yeah, nah, dog, <laughs> yeah, nah, yeah, for real." It's you're like, fucking. You, you go to your therapist and chill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Therapy and chill. That should be a therapy thing. and chill. <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah. No, I love that. That's actually a great title. I think that therapy should be a resource that should be available to everybody. I think that therapy is oh yeah is not just something that should be for people who are mentally unwell or whatever you want to call them. The stigma that's around. When I tell people that I'm in therapy, they're like, some of people understand, but a lot of people are like, oh, like, are you okay? I'm like. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some people are like, "Do you talk?" It's like, no. I this is this therapy. Yeah. This just happens. Yeah. It's like an objective, you know, kind of third party kind of person to listen to, who's educated, yeah. who understands it, and doesn't always offer advice. But it's a completely different context of letting all of that out than doing it within, like, with a friend who's got all of these emotional ties to your life and, you know, understands all these things in your life that are happening that the therapist is detached from, yeah. you know? And it, I think it's healthy. I mean, I... Th- yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. I agree. I think everybody maybe doesn't need to do it all the time, but I heard, I've heard a lot of people tell me that they've never seen a therapist. I'm like, get your ass in that chair and talk, you know? Like, go somewhere mm-hmm. and find somebody and just talk. Yeah, you could also end up taking out your issues on the wrong people if you don't in the wrong ways yeah the wrong yeah. way yeah and just you, like what you said that third party opinion right. is super valuable yeah definitely yeah. yeah i wish it would there was i think the stigma around mental health is shifting a little bit but i think there's still all these these kind of like stereotypes and things that we're kind of holding on to that definitely like absolutely we need to let go of i tell people like if you're doing therapy think of yourself as like tony soprano doing it hmm. but, <laughs> like he, he <laughs> he's still like cool as hell as he does as, as he does it you know what yeah. i mean and still has this crazy life yeah i'm not in you there like, like oh my god my fucking yeah yeah my yeah, dog right. hates me yeah, <laughs> yeah right. right yeah for real <laughs> my dog hates me <laughs> Barked at me twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, uh, so, good. Uh, is there anything that like you're trying to promote coming up, or anything else, anything else you want to go into? I mean, any messages you want to send out there? Be real. Just be real to yourself and everybody else around you. I guess that's been mind. kind of a good theme for the this whole episode. Yeah, yeah. mindfulness is super valuable. Therapy and chill. <laughs> How can people get a hold of you? You don't. You're not very accessible. Don't on contact. Social. No. <laughs> yeah, your Instagram says don't DM me. <laughs> yeah, 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 no DMs. <laughs> I, man, I had to do it. It was just I got out of control. Yeah, so don't but, reach um, out to him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. No. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I right now. Um. I'm, I'm not accepting new clients because we've got a pretty hefty wait list. Yeah. Got a lot of people that I'm already kind of like. That are waiting to, you know, get an appointment. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm chilling right now. Yeah. Cool. You can follow Same. him on Instagram though at Winston the Whale, and check out his dope tattoos. And then you know maybe schedule one down the line. <laughs> <laughs> We're super super happy you came by, man. Thanks for great, having me. Great yeah. conversation. Yeah, it was good. 
We, we talked uh, about some things that I, I didn't expect us to talk about, and this, I like this. This happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this does yeah. happen. I mean, it's kind of our goal a lot of the time, and we want to talk about art, but we want to go, go deeper and find and like discover the artists themselves. Oh, there's, yeah, there's so much more to it it's, than just the the art. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we want to get across. Yeah, it's yeah. not. I mean, it's not. This is an audio medium, and we're talking to visual artists most of the time. Yeah, and so it's like, what can we get out of them that people aren't used to? Right. So yeah. thank you so much for coming yeah, on. This absolutely. was really awesome. Yeah, it was good to good to talk to you guys. Yeah. Good. That being said, thank you to Cascade Street Distillery for North Sister Vodka. Yeah. It's super delicious. Mm-hmm. This is the one we did the bear video too. Yeah. Oh yeah. That being said, Black Bulb, Winston the Whale out. Thanks, guys. Peace. <laughs>